So Lord, we do just thank you again for being here. We thank you for your presence with us, for your word. We ask, Lord, that as we open it, that your Holy Spirit would would do the work that the Holy Spirit does, that you would make it clear to us, that you would show us things, that you would illuminate it, uh, illuminate our hearts, instruct us there, Lord, all those good things that the Holy Spirit does. We'll be talking a little bit about that today. Uh, we just ask for that. We give you permission. We open our hands to you, Lord, that you would take out and put in according to what you want for our lives. And that we would walk out of here today, uh, hopefully a little more like you and a little less like what we are left to our own devices, a little less like what we are in the flesh. There'd be more spirit, less flesh walking out of here today. Lord. Uh, walk out with our heads high and grace and uh, encouragement and, and just enjoy the rest of this beautiful day that you have created for us. This is the day that you have made and we are going to rejoice. We are going to be glad in it today. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Am I loud enough out there? There, there you go. Okay. Said it needed a little more push out that way. So Awesome. Well, we are, we're studying through the book of Galatians. So if you want to follow along, open up to Galatians. If not, I'm going to read it too. It's you know, no big deal. Uh, interesting book in that Paul started these churches in the region of Galatia, uh, gave them the grace message, gave them the gospel. Gospel is just a, a $5 word for the good news, right? Gave them the gospel, and then there were people that came in behind him that tried to throw rules and regulations down on top of the gospel. Like, well, the gospel is good. To be a real Christian, you need to become culturally Jewish first. You need to become circumcised. You need to keep the laws of Moses. And Paul gets wind of this. He's like, what? No, it's just Jesus. It's just Jesus. You don't, want, you don't mess with a good recipe, right? We talked about that on week one. It's a good recipe. You don't mess with a good recipe. And it's like you guys are bringing in these... Uh, trying to bring in the law, trying to bring in rules and checklists uh, so that... It, it's, it's not made that way. It's, it's all Jesus. And so last week, first of all, we saw uh, uh, Peter go down to Jerusalem, visit Peter. All right, Paul went down to Jerusalem, visited Peter and the guys down there. Uh, last week, we saw that Peter and the crew headed north to Antioch, where Paul was. And they met up with him there to visit and see what was going on. And Paul called Peter out on something. He threw a flag on the play. So Peter was sitting down with the whosoever as he was eating with them, he was joining them, it was all fine, they were all one, because that's the way the church is supposed to be. Uh, every ethnos, every people group, every, every race, and you know, man, woman, whatever, everybody comes together and they're one, and, and, and Peter was doing that. All of a sudden, some guys showed up from Jerusalem, the law, the law crew showed up, and Peter like separates away from the Gentiles. And he's just sitting with the Jews, and that created a division which is not what Jesus had in mind at all for his church. That, uh, you know, then you, now you've got an elitism. You've got there's us in the VIP section, and there's the rest of you guys. Uh, you know, and it created division, and that's not at all the church that Jesus wanted, that us and them situation. And in this situation, we also saw that even the leaders, chosen, selected, handpicked by Jesus, were not perfect. Still the case today. I'm here to tell you from personal experience. Uh, they, were, they were still imperfect. They were still works in progress. They were still making mistakes. They were still learning from mis the mistakes as they went on through their entire lives. And so I find that encouraging. That even Peter, who'd come a thousand miles from where he used to be when he was denying Jesus, was still making some mistakes. And the people would come along and that, you know, Paul confronted them. They didn't go to fists, so I'm, I'm assuming that you know, Peter received it. And uh, you, you learn, you get up, you keep going. And none of us are perfect. None of us are perfect, not even the leaders. And then Paul started diving into some uh, theological bedrock about how we're justified. This is good theology, if you're, if you're into that kind of thing. How we are justified. And we saw that people aren't justified by the law. Paul's like, the law does not justify people. The law was good in its time. It foreshadowed everything. It showed us that, that we're not good enough, that we can't, and Jesus can. And uh, so... We were not justified by the law. Uh, I talked about last week how if you see a, you know, I might have been, I'm not usually a speed limit guy. We were running a little bit late this morning. But if you see a, a Ford Explorer on the side of the road, you, what do you do? You check your speedometer. You might hit the brakes. And why? It's because your heart has changed. And, and now I, I just feel compelled by love. 
to obey the speed limit. That's, that's not what it is, is it? You don't want the ticket. You don't want the penalty. And so the law throws down the penalty. And Jesus, on the other hand, comes so that our hearts would be changed, so that we don't need the law. We're going to do the right thing because it's the right thing. We have that, that inward change, the Holy Spirit within us, and we're going to do the right thing even when nobody's looking even when there's no Ford Explorer on the side of the road. You know, we're, we're going to do the right thing because it's the right thing. If the law could justify people, Paul said, the cross wasn't necessary and Jesus, in fact, died for nothing. And that's kind of sad to think about, isn't it? It's like, oh yeah, if, if, if you can just go out and obey enough law to be justified, what Jesus did was, was, was there was no point. There was no point to it. There was no meaning to it. And that, that's a horrible thing to think about. Paul said, instead of living under the law, that he is now truly justified through Christ. What he used to be was crucified with Christ. Crucified with Jesus, and then now his life is Christ living in him. So he took everything he used to be. Uh, that was Paul, the violent persecutor of the faith. Paul, the good rule keeper. He had all those rules on lock. He was pretty good at it. Uh, the great persecutor of the faith. Uh, the guy who imprisoned Christ's followers, who was an accessory to their murder, uh, that guy was crucified with Christ. And he says, now it's Christ that lives in me. We talked about how justification opens the gate for sanctification. Think of yourself as a fixer-upper house. Right? Like, all right, we got a lot of stuff we got to do to our house. It's coming. I know it is, right? Think of yourself as a fixer-upper house on one of those shows, right? People walk in, it's like, hmm, okay. Uh, and... God comes and he takes possession of the house. You don't have to fix the house before he comes and gets the deed, takes possession of the house. We're all fixer-uppers in some way. We're all kind of, we need renovation. We're kind of run down. We're kind of hurting, right? And, and, and Paul says that, uh, that God, he infers that God, uh, I'm losing my train of thought here, <laughs> that uh, God will take the deed. He will take possession of us before we're right, before we're finished. And then the sanctification is what he does after. The sanctification is the fixing up process. You ever watch those shows on uh, like Home and Garden Channel, the Fixer Upper shows? Those are fun. You know, people get in there and it's like, ooh, this place is a wreck, but I can do something with this. And that's God. He walks into our hearts. He's like, hmm, this place needs some work, but I, I, I can do something with this. Right? The bones are good. We're going we're gonna to fix this thing up. He takes possession before it's done. So justification is an event. Sanctification is the ongoing process. I love that. So I, don't have to be, I don't have to be good enough for God to want me, for God to make the purchase, for God to get the deed to my life. Uh, just have to give it to him. Just have to let him have it. So we pick it up today. We're going to go uh, through the end of chapter 2 in Galatians 2.21. Paul says, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through Christ, Christ died for nothing. That's what we were just talking about. You foolish Galatians. Oh, this is fun. <laughs> he's, he's kind of jumping on him a little bit. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish after beginning by means of the Spirit? Are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain, if it really was in vain? So again I ask, does God give you the Spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by your believing what you heard? So Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And that's, that's going to be our lead into to next week. Uh, so Paul says, I do not set aside the grace of God. Set aside, uh, in the Greek, that means to do away with, to get rid of something. There are lots of things in our lives we should probably set aside and do away with. Uh, debt, processed foods, uh, smoking, you know. There are things that, that don't help us that we should probably set aside. Uh, we need to set aside our bath towels. Because they're... I don't think they're supposed, you're supposed to be able to see daylight through them. 
You know, sometimes things just wear out. We need to set those things aside. We do not set aside, we should not set aside the grace of God. And that's what we do when we embrace law, when we embrace rules as a means of finding God's favor. Lots of things we should set aside. The grace of God, not one of them. And he says, oh, you foolish Galatians. Foolish is the Greek word aniatos. And it can be one of two things. First of all, it can be under, one, one who cannot be understood, one who is an unintelligible, people who don't make sense, and that happens in a couple ways. I could, you know, get up here and speak to you in Farsi if I knew Farsi, and many of you would not know Farsi, and I would be like, Phew. I can get up here and use big theological words, I can get out my concordance and use the biggest $10 theological words I can find, and that might, you know, go over a lot of people's heads. It's, it's not communication. It's just me being arrogant, trying to look cool, right? Something my wife cured me of that a lot of pastors do. Well, you all know the story of. You ever hear that from the pulpit? You've heard the story. Not everybody's heard the story. I grew up around church. She did not, and boy, the perspective she brings. She's like, don't do that. People might not know the story. And so we need to assume that it's arrogant for me to get up here and think that everybody's heard the story. I need to tell the story if I want everybody to know the story. Uh, so you know, I try not to do that anymore. So I can get up here, I can talk over people's heads. That's kind of arrogant. I can talk a different language. No communication going on. Or you know, people, you might comprehend what they're saying, but they're not tracking with reality. You ever run across this? It's like, ooh. Where's the door? I gotta get away from it. Not tracking with reality. They say stuff and they just make you look at them like the old RCA Victor dog. Anybody remember that? The RCA albums? And the dog's looking in the, the gramophone record player, that big horn thing coming up. He's all. Some people just make you look at them like that. You're like, yeah. what's going on? I got, I got to work for a lot of years in a, a casino showroom. And one of the joys of my life during that time was drunk people. And they've always got something to say. And they come up, and I remember this one time, this guy, he wanted me to get the band to play a certain song, and it was not the kind of band it was. It was not a song the band was gonna play, and he's you know, like, Sir Slee, Sir Slee, need to have it. And I'm like, oh, Aniatos. It's like, dude, I'm just not tracking, you're not tracking with reality, let me out. And then number two definition of that is one who lacks understanding and or is unwise. Either not knowing or knowing better and not doing better. And it's always better to not know than to know and not do better. Right? And I, I think the Galatian Christians that Paul was addressing here had elements of both types of this. Paul's like, I can't even track with you guys. Like, you've got this beautiful grace recipe, this justification that requires nothing from you but to bring yourself to it. And you don't have to obey rules. You don't have to keep laws. And here you are. You're bringing in law. You're allowing this to come in and pile that on top of the gospel, on top of the good news. And that makes it not so good news. I can't even track with you guys as you're doing this. And they knew better, but they weren't doing better. And then Paul says, who has bewitched you? Those were kind of hard words. You foolish people, who has bewitched you? It's a bit of a hyperbole in the statement. Not that there were any actual spells, no wands and Harry Potter stuff going on here, but it's kind of a hyperbole. Paul's saying, it's like he's saying, it's like you guys are under the influence of something. It's like you're not in your right minds right now. What are you thinking? What is going on? It's like you guys are, somebody's run some kind of Jedi mind trick on you. It's not the draw that you're looking for. You need law on top of grace. We need law on top of grace. It's like, who's bewitched you? What are you guys thinking? Clouding their judgment and perception. So you know better. So why are you taking this bait? You guys know Jesus. I've been to, like, Jesus, Galatians, Galatians, Jesus. Amen. And it's like, you know, I, I made the introduction. You, you know the good news, and yet here you are. I don't understand why you're doing this. And he says, in front of your very eyeballs, Jesus Christ was portrayed as crucified. He already said, if, if we could get in, if you could get God's favor through keeping laws and rules, the crucifixion of Christ was pointless. He says, through your very eyes, I put it right in front of you, right in front of your face, that Jesus was crucified. I put it right in front of you. In the Greek, this word portrayed, it means Jesus crucified was presented. It was on display for them in such a way that they couldn't miss it. There are things you can't miss. 
Anybody happen to miss the Chicken Ranch Casino on your way to town? That's, you know, that's portrayed as the Greek would have it. It's right there. And uh, unless you're sleeping, you're, you're going to notice that thing out there, right? It's like, oh, wow. And even if you're sleeping, you know when you're sleeping in a car and you start slowing down, you wake up, right? You got to slow down for that roundabout. Where are we? What are we doing? What's going on? The, the roundabout. Not even going to go there. But that's what it's talking about. It's like right there in front of your face, unavoidable. Boom. There it is. Jesus crucified. Like a billboard. We should notice, we should be impacted by the crucifixion of Jesus. It, it should be difficult to be ambivalent to the idea of crucifixion. Crucifixion is horrible. Horrible way to go. Uh, it should be difficult to be ambivalent to that. It's more difficult to be unaffected by the crucifixion of the one who personified love, who personified innocence, who was righteousness, who came to be Emmanuel, that is God with us. He came to be God with us. Perfect executed on the cross. It should be even harder to ignore that. And Paul made it a centerpiece. Jesus crucified. Jesus was put out there so they couldn't miss it, so they couldn't ignore it. So they'd have to engage it. They'd have to struggle with it. They would have to come to terms with it. And I hope that most of the stuff I say is doing that too. It's taking Jesus crucified, Jesus resurrected, and just putting it right in front of you so that you have to wrestle with it, so you have to come to terms with it, you have to process it. And then Paul says, I would like to learn just one thing from you. And Paul wasn't saying, oh, you wise Galatians, I know you don't have much time, but if I could just implore you for one bit of your wisdom to enlighten my... That's not what he was saying. Uh, it kind of sounds like that in, in the language that is presented here. What it was more like was, if you've ever been arguing with somebody and they're like, let me just ask you something. That's what it's more like. And you know that's going to be followed by a question that's going to make their argument. It's probably going to sweep your legs right out from under you in your argument, right? Let me just ask you one thing, right? And that's what he's saying. He says, how did you receive the Spirit, capital S? That's the Holy Spirit. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. One God eternally existed in three, three persons. How did you receive the Spirit? Was it by keeping the rules of the Jewish law or by simply believing what you heard? And they believed in Jesus, and so they received the indwelling Holy Spirit. That's how it works. It's like Jesus, yes. Holy Spirit moves in, takes up residence. It was like way before they started doing this rule-keeping thing. Now the Holy Spirit, God is present in us and with us through the Holy Spirit. Uh, in the same way that God was present in the temple for the Jewish people in the Old Testament. You know, they had the, the outer court, the, the holy place, and they had the, the holy of holies, which is where God, the presence of God was. High priest got to go in there once a year, walled off by this giant curtain that was inches thick, big old heavy, heavy, heavy curtain. And uh, you know what? When Jesus died on the cross, the Bible says that 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 curtain, that temple veil, was torn from top to bottom. That means it wasn't us that did it. It was God that said, this is done. Because now, my place is with people. Now, the Holy Spirit gets to come. The Holy Spirit gets to move in so that my temple is here in our own hearts. It's beautiful. 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20 says, Do you not know that your bodies, and this is Paul talking to the Corinthian church, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Bought with a price. He's just taking that, that price, that crucifixion, and he's portraying it. He's putting it front and center so that people can't ignore it for all the, all the letters he wrote. With the Holy Spirit moving in comes gifting, comes instruction, conviction of sin, less flesh, more spirit, right? More Jesus. That sanctification, that renovation we talked about, the Holy Spirit moves in and starts pulling up boards and knocking down walls and, you know, repainting and plastering and fixing things. It's that renovation that we talked about. Verse 5 says that they were also experiencing miracles. Paul says, look around at what is happening with you guys in these Galatian churches. Look around. What has happened among you through the Spirit, through the presence of God, in your churches, in your persons, as you gather? That happened before you got the sales pitch to go back under the law. 
So the Holy Spirit was there. The Holy Spirit was working. They were seeing miraculous stuff. And man, sometimes miracles happen. Sometimes God shows up. Uh, we pray, and it's, it's mind blowing. I've, I've seen it happen. You know, sometimes God answers those prayers, and there's the miraculous. Often, it's not. It's it's always miraculous. He's always at work. But there was a time back in our church in Sacramento where one of our ladies was diagnosed with a throat tumor. We prayed over her, we laid hands on her, and she went to the doctor to get ready for uh, you know, the consultation for the surgery and all the treatment, and they couldn't find it. It's like I prayed, and I wasn't expecting God to really do anything. You know, and that like, he shows up. He just shows up sometimes, and, and he, he does things. That's the Holy Spirit. Uh, we were up at Silver Lake one time. You know, we get up and we do these worship songs, and sometimes... We really feel good, and sometimes we don't. We do them. It's our sacrifice of praise. It's what we bring. One of the things that we can bring to the Father, you know, is we bring what little we have, and we trust Him for the rest as we do this. And uh, we did that up at this little tiny church in Silver Lake, probably about as big as this area. It's just a little tiny place, and a big window. You can see the mountain and the lake outside. And we lit into our songs, and we started doing them. And something hit. You know, it's like the Holy Spirit is like this place. People from all different churches packed into this little room. And, oh, something happened. And my wife had never experienced that. kind of freaked her out. You know, it's the Holy Spirit just doing that work. Whether you feel it. You know, we like the liver quiver. That's, that's what I call it. Or, ooh, yeah, that was good. And sometimes we don't feel anything. Doesn't mean God's not there, that God's not working. So uh, it's the, the work of the Holy Spirit. And it was going on there before they had the urge or before they were compelled to have circumcision, the law of Moses, to bring all these things back into play. All these things were at work. God was at work. The Holy Spirit was there. Miracles were happening. Simply believing brought all this on. Paul then says, are you so foolish? Same word. Are you so foolish? After having started in the Spirit, are you trying to finish in the flesh? It started with faith in Jesus. And at that point, you receive the Holy Spirit, right? He says, having started with that, are you trying to cross the finish line under your own strength? Are you trying to cross the finish line based on what you can do and what you can bring to the table? Because that's, the law shows us that's not good enough. It's like starting the John Muir Trail or the Pacific Crest Trail with boots and pack. And, you know, we did the JMT, and there's something about standing there at the beginning. There are, you know, happy aisles at the trailhead. It's like, hmm. All right, so this is it, huh? Okay. And putting that first foot forward. We got video of the first feet going forward and starting. And it's like you start with boots and a pack, and then you get down to the end, and it's like, I really don't, you know, I, I, I think I'm just going to finish. I'm going to leave the trail. I'm going to finish just by watching pictures and videos at the end. Oh, like negates everything, right? It's not what it's all about. Pictures and videos are good. They're good before you start the hike. It'll help you get ready. You can see what other people are doing out there. You can see what the terrain's like, what the weather's like. It's terrible sometimes. Uh, and it helps you to prepare. But being present and hiking the hike in real time, stepping your booted up foot across the starting line, getting to the end, stepping your booted up, worn out booted up foot, foot, foot. Oh, that's Norwegian there for a minute. <laughs> you're, you're worn out booted up foot across the finish line, oh, that's where it's at. That's where it's at. In the same way, starting under the power and guidance of the Holy Spirit is awesome. Just make sure we finish that way. And we struggle. We want to we wanna do something. We want to have something we can bring. And it's hard to, hard to not do that. It's like, okay, if I can just like, lay down this regiment of stuff, it's going to make me more appealing to God. It's going to help me to find God's favor more. We don't need that. Paul said, if you suffered so much in vain for no good reason, if it really was in vain for no good reason, they had no doubt suffered uh, persecution and some backlash for their faith. If, and Paul says, if the Judaizers are right, and you aren't Christian until you start to follow the law, until you're circumcised, until you embrace the law of Moses, you're being persecuted for a faith that is incomplete. You're being persecuted for a faith that really isn't. It's not even yours. And you guys are being persecuted for that. How dumb is that? Sucks to be you guys. Right? If that's the case. So we're, that's as far as we're going today. All right? I just want to 
bring up some things that we can take away from this, that we can take to the mountain, we can take to the lake, that we can wrestle with, that we can have bouncing around in our hearts as we go today. First of all, justification is through Jesus and what he has done on our behalf. That is the simple gospel. That's the recipe. Simple recipe. You don't mess with a good recipe. Uh, beware of laws. Beware of rules. Beware of metrics that people try and add on to that simple gospel for you to make you better, more holy. Uh, spending a half hour quiet time in the morning with God. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, it's not a law thing, right? Uh, reading X number of chapters of the Bible each day. You have to journal at least once a day, preferably twice. And, you know, if you miss it, mmm, oh boy, that's, you know, that's no good. These are all good things, but they don't elevate our salvation. They don't make us more saved. They don't make God love us more by doing these things. They're good, but they're not a part of our salvation. We were actually told from the pulpit one time, we were sitting under a teaching, that uh, if you're reading your Bible an hour a day, you need to read it too. If you're reading it too, you need to read it three, because whatever you're doing, it's not enough. You need to do more. And we're just like, Ew. I definitely gave her the ickies, right? I don't know about that. And that's like throwing law down. That's bondage. That's legalism. That's no longer freedom. Uh, if you're in Christ, if you're free in Christ and you're following him, it's like, oh, I love you. I want to spend that time with you. I want to, not everybody's a journaler, but no, I want to journal. I want to read your word. I want to spend time with you. Not because I have to, but because it's what I want to do. We need to ditch the checklist mentality. Uh, you know when I spend time with my wife? I don't do it as, uh, I know I should, like research shows. It's good to spend time with your spouse. <laughs> you should listen to them. You should in interact conversationally with them. And this goes for any relationship. This goes for your children, your parents, your friends. It's good to interact with people and, and foster that relationship. And I don't wake up in the morning going, I'm awful busy today, but I need to carve out like 45 minutes to an hour, something I have to do to sit down and be with her and listen to her. I should ask her some questions. I should receive some feedback on what she's thinking. I don't, I don't do that. I like her. I like her. I want to be with her. And so, you know, if you, those relationships usually want to be with those people. Why would our relationship with God be any different? Why would we wake up in the morning and go, oh, I got this checklist. I have to do my two hours of Bible reading. Well, now three, because two wasn't enough. I have to do that, and I have to journal, and I have to... I have to spend X amount of time in prayer. I always fall asleep when I pray, and then I feel guilty. And, you know, don't come at it with a checklist. Just come to him. I'm a father. Put your hands up like a little kid. Like little kids coming to you, and they're like, up. Do that. Just come to him and go, up. And spend the time with him. He wants to spend the time with you, and, and man, he's done so much. Made it so easy for us at his expense to be justified, why wouldn't we just come to him and go up and be in his arms, right? Need to ditch that checklist mentality. There are the good things out there that we can do, that we should do, but they don't make God love us more. It's just a natural byproduct of us wanting to, to love God and spend time with him. Second thing, sanctification is a meaningful process. Renovation isn't always clean, it's not always pretty, most of the time it's not, uh, but it's good. Right? How many of those shows have you seen where they get in and they start tearing up the floors like, wow, this is worse than we thought. That's the story of my life. <laughs> we're just going to put a new floor down and start ripping the stuff. Ooh, yeah, we're going to have to fix that. Okay. Not always pretty, but it's good. Sometimes things have to get wrecked so that it can be made better. God is our God during that process. We don't need to do our own renovation before he will embrace us and take the deed of our lives as his own. We don't have to do that. He'll do that for us. I've heard it said, one of the things, you know, back in the old church in Sacramento, God fishes from the bottom, but he always cleans his catch, right? That means we don't have to be good enough. We don't have to obey enough rules for God to show up in our lives and do things and even miraculous things. It's not predicated on our own worthiness. It's predicated on his goodness. Being good enough is religion. 
you know, there's a difference between religion. Jesus is not a religion. Religion, historically, is man trying to appease God, appease a God, appease a group of gods. The gods are usually pretty ticked off, and it's trying to appease them and talk, calm them down a little bit. That is religion. Christianity, on the other hand, is God reaching across the chasm, God reaching across to us. It's like, I will come to you, I will reach out for you. Just come with me. Mm. Number three thing, God's table is not a potluck. It's fully catered with good stuff. He wants us to come to his table. And when we come to his table, we're sitting there with a, just a motley crew of people. You, you know, you might sit there with people you didn't expect to find there. And, and uh, we don't have to bring anything except ourselves. It's not a potluck. We can show up with something. He's like, oh, good, another potato salad. I'll put it over here with the other 30 potato salads. That's nice. It's one of the times when it's okay to show up empty-handed. If you show up to God's table empty-handed, then he can put things in it for you. It is fully catered with all the good stuff. And lastly, we should ask ourselves this morning, are there ways that we're attempting to finish in the flesh? Are there like rules that have crept in? Some kind of law, some kind of checklist mentality that's kept in? Uh, do we find ourselves in that place of bargaining with God for his favor and blessing? We do that, especially in times of crisis. God, I will be so good if you will just intervene this one time. I will be so good. I won't do this anymore. I promise. You know, we try and bargain with him. We don't have to bargain with him. He's, his goodness is toward us. He is for us. So we don't have to bargain with him for his blessing. So are there traditions or checklists that are more important than they should be? It might need to be put back in the rightful place. We need to take all those checklists, all those things we do, we need to submit them to the grace of God. So a heart in a right place, justification, that just means you're put in a right place in a right relationship with God. A justified heart then opens for sanctification. And you're going to want to do these things. You're going to want to spend time with God. You're going to want to read His Word. You're going to want to hear from Him. And uh, you know, it doesn't work the other way around, necessarily. right? You don't... The ticket you get from the CHP doesn't make you change your heart and want to obey the law. You just do it to avoid the penalty. So, justification, sanctification. So, again, justification is through Jesus. Sanctification is meaningful and painful. Uh, God's table is not a potluck. And we need to ask ourselves if we're falling into that rule trap this morning. So, Lord, we thank you again for the day. We thank you for your word. Uh, this is... This portion of scripture, this is just so foundational. Lord, I pray that if we're struggling with keeping rules, if we're struggling with religion, if our relationship with you has become religious, if it's become a systematic thing we just do as a, as a kind of a checklist, Lord, that we would repent of that, that we would, we would turn away uh, and turn back to you, turn back to your grace and just seek to know you, to be with you, to, to know you is to love you, Lord. We know that you are crazy about us. We thank you that uh, if we were to walk by your refrigerator, our pictures are on your refrigerator, Lord. You just love us. You're crazy about us. And uh, we just pray that today we would take all that religious stuff, that we would drop that, open our hands, extend our hands to you, and say, up, Abba Father, up. So, uh, Lord, we just... Thank you for what you've done for us, that, that the crucifixion was not meaningless. It was, in fact, was incredibly meaningful. And we thank you that our Jesus was crucified, that our Jesus didn't stay dead, that our Jesus rose from the dead, ascended from heaven, that there, there was life. He took hold of life, put sin to death, took hold of life, and that we can follow in that, Lord. And we just pray that we would do that today. If we're struggling, uh, if we needed to hear this uh, today, Lord, I just pray that we would drop our stuff and open our hands to you today and we just look forward to what you have for us the rest of the day we pray for the safety of everybody on the mountain uh, that people just have a good time that they would see you out there they would encounter you see your fingerprints all over this beautiful creation that you made for us to enjoy and we look forward to the rest of the day we thank you in jesus name amen, amen.